I am speaking out today to challenge the way my daughter has been silenced for rising up against the men who sexually abused her. I'm speaking out today because since my daughter spoke her truth, I've had to fight harder than I've ever had to, to protect her and keep her safe. This battle hasn't been against her abusers. It's been against the very services whose job it is to protect and safeguard her. We have had to fight back against the police, fight back against social services and fight back against IDAS. I am speaking out today because I know our truth is one that needs to be heard. I know that we are not alone in what we have experienced. I can't tell you the number of times my daughter has sobbed in my arms about the action of the police or social services and said to me, what if I didn't have you, mum? What about all the women and children who don't have anyone to be there for them? Together We Rise is so important to us because we believe in unity and standing together. Right now, I am speaking out for my daughter because her voice matters. When I rise for her, I rise for every other woman and child who is being bullied, threatened and abused for speaking their truth. We know all too well that when an abuser has money, power, status and celebrity, there is a long history in this country of the police's failure to act. We all know of cases where the police have allowed abuse to continue. And it's my belief this pattern of behaviour is deeply ingrained in our police force. We also know there are many factors that make a victim less likely to be heard should they speak out. Disability is one of these factors. My daughter is blind, and this not only makes her more vulnerable to experiencing abuse, it also means she has less chance of her abusers being prosecuted. Had the police actually bothered to investigate the crime she spoke out about, somebody would have had a conversation about her credibility as a witness before deciding whether to take action against the men who abused her. I can't live in a world where this happens without speaking out. My daughter's future depends on what she sees from me. Growing up, she saw me abused. She saw me broken. She saw me silenced. I role modeled keeping quiet about abuse because that's what I learned as a child. We stayed quiet no matter what and my daughter saw me continue this pattern. So she won't ever see me silenced again. I am ready to speak my truth, all of it. There are labels people can throw at me to try and discredit me, but it won't stop me. Mental health issues is another factor that can make women more vulnerable to being abused and less likely to being believed if they report it. My own family have tried to use my historic mental health issues as a reason my daughter should not be believed. They have gone as far as to ringing the police and social services against me, questioning my mental health and my daughter's safety in my care. I won't allow them or anyone else to silence me again. I stand firm in my own truth. Right now, <clears throat> the police are trying to silence me. They have asked me to stop speaking out on social media and I am now facing a police interview for allegations of harassment made by my daughter's dad and her stepmom because in my last video, I explained how heartbroken Ashley is at having no contact with her siblings for seven months because she spoke out about abuse. The fact I am now being interviewed for harassing the same man who sexually abused my daughter makes me sick. 
This man not only abused my daughter, he abused me too. Something the police know about, but have done nothing. I reported this man raped and abused me to Detective Gemma Illich on two separate occasions in June. I told Gemma that I couldn't let my daughter face her abusers alone when both men had raped me too. I told her I had been the victim of domestic abuse at the hands of both these men and asked her if I could make a statement. She told me she was going to pass this on to detectives, yet more than four months later, I have still heard nothing. Gemma Illich is not the only police officer I have reported this to. I have informed six other police officers, both in person and via email. I have emailed Sergeant Tom Watson, PC Martland and the police commissioner informing each of them that I reported being raped to a detective and she did nothing. I have every intention of sharing details of the communication I've had with these police officers because quite frankly, their responses have been utterly appalling. I have been dismissed, ignored, lied to and had officers hide behind a complaints procedure when what I needed was to be treated like a human being. What I deserved was for somebody to hear me. It is clear to me that the police have no intention of supporting me and my daughter. They have failed in their duty to investigate the most serious of crimes. So my only option now is to speak out. I am speaking out about Detective Gemma Illich for ignoring reports of rape and domestic abuse. I am speaking out about Detective Gemma Illich for failing to investigate the sexual abuse my daughter reported. She refused to have anyone look at the crime scene. She refused to look at evidence that supported my daughter had been drugged and sexually abused by my ex-partner. I told Gemma I had found photos and letters that led me to believe my ex-partner may have groomed and abused other girls in his position as a teacher. I told Gemma I had also worked in education and there is no way a teacher should have pictures where he has his arms wrapped around students in his care. Gemma asked if the photos were child pornography and when I replied no, she shut me down. She was unwilling to explore the possibility there may have been other victims and she was happy to release this man off bail, free to go back to his job working with children. In doing this, she not only failed my daughter, she failed in her duty to safeguard the wider public. She also failed to adequately safeguard Ashley's two younger siblings. The police and social services together decided it was appropriate to allow a man they were investigating for sexual abuse to continue having access to his two younger children with the supervision of their mum. Something I have been told is not standard practice. Something that gave a clear message to my daughter that she was not believed. This message was reinforced when Gemma took no action after we were broken into. The same week, Ashley reported being sexually abused to the police. And she failed <coughs> to even log the second break-in we reported to her. Since Ashley reported being sexually abused, we have been broken into on five separate occasions and the police have failed to investigate any of them. The day of the first break-in, we had heard banging in the attic that had been padlocked as it was full of our landlord's belongings. We were scared, so we went out. 
when we came home, the padlock had been smashed off. Evidence, somebody had been in our home. The police officers who attended started by suggesting perhaps our landlord had broken in. When I explained they lived in Australia, the police then said it might have been the estate agents and they were going to contact them. I couldn't understand why they were suggesting an estate agent had illegally entered our home for no apparent reason within days of us reporting sexual abuse to the police. I was then told by one of the officers that there was no way someone had been in our attic as it was covered in cobwebs. I knew he was lying. So I asked the female police officer to come upstairs with me as I wanted her police camera to record the fact a police officer had lied to my face. As expected, there were no cobwebs. What I did find were smash plates on the floor. I challenged the police officers for lying and asked why they were trying to give me a narrative instead of investigating the crime. They could not give me an answer. I was told crime scene officers would come out, but this never happened. My daughter and I were not safe in our home. We were terrified knowing we were at risk and we no longer trusted the police. We spent a few nights in a hotel before relocating to a refuge as I couldn't think of another way of keeping my daughter safe. When we returned home to collect some belongings, we found feces smeared on a bath mat and towel. We knew somebody was trying to intimidate us. We reported this to Gemma Illage and another police officer. They did nothing. So I put cameras in my home because I knew me and my daughter weren't safe and I knew the police had no intention of taking action. On the 6th of July, the same day the police closed the investigation into the men who abused my daughter, CCTV showed my ex-partner breaking into our home. As I had already emailed several complaints to the, to the police commissioner, and at this point, I still believe she may help us, I emailed her saying I had evidence of a further break-in and told her I no longer trusted the police. I asked to meet with her to show her the evidence, but I hit a brick wall. So when he broke in again on the 15th of July, we had no choice but to contact the police ourselves. The cameras were linked to my phone so I could see him in my house. He spotted a camera this time though, and me and my daughter had to listen to him talking about how much he loved us both and would do anything to get us back. Ashley was retching listening to his speech, knowing he was in our house, knowing the police had allowed this to happen. She was shaking as we drove to the house to meet the police. We were both terrified waiting for the two officers to arrive. They went inside to search the house, while my daughter and I waited outside trembling. At this point, they hadn't known I had CCTV. I was watching the upstairs camera and heard one of the officers communicate over the radio that, as expected, nobody is here. I went inside and I called them downstairs to challenge them. I told them me and my daughter had just heard them via CCTV and their comments told us what we already knew. The police didn't believe us. I was furious my daughter was having to go through this ordeal and we had had to go to the lengths of buying cameras to prove this man was breaking into our home. By this point, my daughter had revealed more to me about the abuse she had suffered. My ex-partner not only sexually abused my daughter, 
He allowed other men access to abuse her too. One of my daughter's abusers is a police officer who lived next door. I told the police officers that Detective Gemma Illich had failed to investigate the crimes against my daughter, that she had completely ignored my reports of rape and domestic abuse, and that we were living in a refuge because the police had done nothing when we had been broken into. I told them that both the men who lived next door to us had been involved in abusing my daughter. And I saw the fear in their eyes when I told them one of these men was a police officer. I showed the officers the CCTV footage which shows my ex entering our home via one of the two attics in the house. I showed them proof that my ex was not a tenant and therefore had no right to be in the house. The police spoke to our neighbours and they said they had seen my ex coming out the back door. But the back door was not only locked, it was bolted twice on the inside. The front door had also been locked when the police arrived, <coughs> which meant our neighbours had lied to the police. I told the police the locks had been changed since we had reported my ex to the police for sexual abuse and there was no sign of breaking and entering. I showed the police the CCTV footage that showed him entering from the door to the attic. He had been accessing my property via one of our neighbour's attics. The police told us that they were going to take a statement from me and get stills from the CCTV in the next few days, but that never happened. Despite me following up with the police and my ex-partner breaking in yet again. Following this break-in, I emailed the commissioner, challenging her for hiding behind processes and hiding behind red tape. I told her, this is why we still have women being murdered in this country after coming to the police about their abusers. And when she closed the door on us being able to provide her with evidence, she forced my daughter to go through further trauma. I told her that my ex-partner, along with a ring of men, all abused my daughter. And one of those men is a police officer. I also reached out to Lado, as my ex-partner worked at Leeds City Academy and the police's failure to act meant he was free to continue working as a teacher. I shared details of the way the police and social services failed my daughter. I let them know that my ex-partner was not the only teacher from Leeds City Academy who abused my daughter. I told them I was scared for the children at that school. On the 5th of August, we returned home to find there had been a further break-in. As a number of my ex's belongings had gone along with my TV. We reported the break-in and theft and the fact I was now being harassed by my ex-partner via email and Facebook. He was setting up new accounts on Facebook after I had blocked him to message me, telling me he loved me and would never give up on what we'd had. He wanted to meet me. I told the police the messages were sickening and extremely distressing. I gave a full history of our involvement with the police and asked why, four weeks after our last break-in, we had still heard nothing from the police. I didn't know how they could get away with ignoring these crimes when they had CCTV footage. Sergeant Tom Watson responded to my email. As I said earlier, I intend to share more about the communication I've had with the police to date as I've been shocked and appalled at this communication. The emails show a culture in the police force of officers closing rank 
when the conduct of the police is challenged. It was clear to me that turning a blind eye is the norm to Sergeant Tom Watson. He told me PC Willingham had attended the break-in on the 15th and he was going to email him and his Sergeant PS Smith to follow up. It seemed strange, yet convenient, that I wasn't hear hearing from Sergeant Smith himself, as my email related to two break-ins his PC had failed to do anything about. I asked to deal with the same officer for all the break-ins as they were related, and it made no sense for me to, for me to be dealing with different officers, but Tom Watson would not allow this to happen. He completely shut me down when I raised the fact I had reported being raped to a detective and she had done nothing. He didn't acknowledge my report of harassment. He too hid behind the complaints procedure when I challenged him about our experience with the police. Tom Watson told me that a police officer would be in touch regarding this break-in. I was told he would meet with me, meet with me and would take a statement. Again, this did not happen. PC Martland did not want to meet with me or take a statement. He refused to attend the property, despite me emailing him about the seriousness of a man repeatedly gaining access to my property after we had reported him to the police for sexual abuse, rape and domestic violence. I was stunned when PC Martlin revealed he had spoken to my ex-partner who had confirmed he had broken in, yet North Yorkshire police were taking no further action. The email communication I have had with PC Martland was disgraceful. The focus of this video has been the police's failure to investigate serious crimes we have reported to them. I don't know the reason why. Whether it's because I raised the part social services had to play in my daughter being abused by her dad. Whether it's because her abusers are charismatic and charming. Whether it's because of all the complaints I've raised. Whether it's because my daughter is disabled. Or whether it's because a police officer was also involved in the abuse. I don't know. What I do know is the police and social services are guilty of more than refusing to investigate and safeguard. They have worked together and come for me and my daughter. They have abused their powers to try and silence and discredit us. I have proof of this and I am going to continue to speak out. The fact I am facing a police interview for harassing my daughter's abuser is just one of the ways the police have tried to silence me. I've been told that this needs to be dealt with as a matter of urgency. What the police and social services don't realise is their attempts to bully and harass me and my daughter have only made me more determined if we are going to make progress in breaking the cycle of sexual abuse, we have to ensure every man, woman and child feels safe enough to speak out. They need to receive help and support from the police and social services. What me and my daughter have experienced is the furthest thing from help and support. It has felt more like a living nightmare. I know change is needed. And for this to happen, people need to rise up. And this, and this is me rising up for my daughter.